Hello and welcome again to the Dan John Podcast. This is episode number 18. Welcome back. So this is a tough time of year for those of us in the fitness industry because everyone makes these things called resolutions. And the most common resolution is I'm going to get fit. I'm going to lose fat. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. But I'm always reminded that the month January is named after the god Janus. And he is very the Roman god, but he's very much like the Celtic gods with one head looking this way and one head looking the other. And one of the things I like to remind people of is if you make a resolution, before you plan out this direction this way, look backwards. I tell this to people all the time, and I tell you, this does not make people happy. You are the sum of your habits. You are the sum. What you are today, where you're sitting in your chair right now, you are the sum of your habits. Um, if you like where you are, you probably have some habits that worked out pretty good. If you don't like where you are, you need to look backwards a little bit and see what got you there. Uh, I'm working on my workshop for 2020 right now. And there's three things I want to share with you, and I, and, I, and I hope these, I call this section of the workshop Coaching 101, you know, the fundamentals of coaching. And there's three parts to it, and I th think I need to explain in a lot of depth all of them. The first is three words. Embrace the obvious. You want to be a better shot putter? You got to throw the shot. You want to be better at basketball? You might want to consider playing and practicing more basketball. You want to be a better guitar player? I would suggest playing the guitar. Now, you probably are sitting there and go, well, that's obvious. Right. Embrace the obvious. If you decide this year you want to lose some body fat, well, what you better drink is water. Water is <laughs> water hydrates you, which is this. I hate the word hydrate. Water is what your body craves. Um, you need to sleep more. Well, damn, that's obvious. Right. One thing you find about sleeping more is most people don't eat while they sleep. You need to do some kind of caloric restriction, and there's a million options there. And you need to probably, at some level, and I think it goes like this, I think it goes sleep, nutrition, and exercise. You need to sleep more. You probably need to drink more water, eat more vegetables, eat more protein. And then at some level, you got to increase your exercise. And yeah, it's obvious. Embrace it. Love it. The second point in my coaching 101 is invest wisely in asymmetrical risks. Asymmetrical risks. Um, my classic examples, in fact, I have one right there. Um, I buy these $20 backpacks. And in these backpacks is a three day supply of food, water, basic medical care, emergency blankets, and stuff like that uh, for uh, a, a three-day supply for four people. Um, so if my wife and I both have them, that gives us oh, somewhere around 10 days of survival, 12 days of survival. They cost 20 bucks each. I doubt I'll ever use one of those. But if I ever do need one, that $20 is a million dollars. If my daughter breaks down at the side of the road here in Utah, which is very can be very dangerous, I know that her and my grandkids have a couple days supply of water and we know that we'll, we'll get to them. It may be we don't get there in an hour or so, but I can guarantee she'll get help in three, in three days. But for the survival of my grandkids, that 20 bucks is nothing. As a coach, asymmetrical risks are all kinds of things. In American football, there's all these weird little situations that can happen in a game. One's called a free kick. What do you do when someone muffs a punt? Hmm. A two-point conversion defense, onside kick offense. There's about 100 different things, these small little plays that might only come up once a season, but you better practice them sometime because not practicing them gives you so much better opportunity to win over time. And the third thing in, in, in coaching 101 is this phrase here, respect the process and the results will take care of themselves. 
the biggest mistake I see with New Year's resolutions, and I got nothing against them, but it's a result. You look at the results. I want to lose 10 pounds. Okay, that's a thing. You want to lose 10 pounds? Get a really, really good case of diarrhea. That'll make you lose 10 pounds. Get the flu. Get that two-week flu where you vomit and stuff comes out of every orifice. Um, in my case, I went to the Middle East and picked up a parasite. Man, I lost 40 pounds in two weeks. But that's results. Let's look at the process. I believe in a thing called shark habits. And I got this from Pat Flynn, where you write out these things like uh, the biggest one for me is number one is my sleep ritual, my sleep hygiene, making sure I get a good night's sleep every night. Number two is I wake up and I try to be grateful. Number three, I take a one minute meditation every day. Number four, really it's the A, B, I, I work out at Epic Fitness and I do A, B, A, B, A, B workouts. And then the other couple days a week, um, I do uh, original strength and I'll go for walks and things like that. And then the fifth one is I try to eat eight different vegetables every day. By the way, I've only had one meal today and I've already got that done. But I figure this. If I do those five things, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, I'll be like I am right now. Now, I just before I say this, I know I cheated on this. But this past year, I lost 36 pounds and dropped 11% body fat. The true reason is because I had a total hip replacement and I'm not in chronic pain. But at the same time, according to my doctor, I'm making the best progress of, well, I got to be careful here. I'm making very good progress compared to many others. And I don't think it's because I focus on results, is I focus on those day to day to day to day things. A great resolution might be, instead of having a open-ended resolution, have a process revolution, uh, resolution. Every day I'm going to write a to-do list before I go to bed. By the way, it really helps you sleep better. Every day I'm going to, every day I'm going to, every day I'm going to. Have a shark habit, ha have shark habits for the little things in life and a pirate map for the big things. i thinking I might have confused you by saying the wrong word. Pirate maps come from Pat Flynn. They're very simple. Basically, he teaches it this way. Uh, go to St. John's Island, find the white co coconut tree, take seven paces from the to the west, dig down, and there's the treasure. A pirate map is... Do this, 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 and this. And at the end of a year, you lose 36 pounds without even thinking about it. So I don't care if you make resolutions or not. But the important thing is this. If you're going to do something like fat loss, embrace the obvious. Drink more water, eat more vegetables, go for a walk. Um, be sure to take care of asymmetrical risks. See your dentist, see your doctor. See your eye doctor. Uh, if you have little th weird things growing on your skin, get those looked at. And then finally, respect the process. Um, I always tell my athletes, Rome wasn't built in a day, but I wasn't the foreman on that job. But the, the, the joke is everybody knows it takes time to build a city, to build a great building, to build a great education. Respect the process, and the results will take care of themselves. Good luck in this upcoming year. Okay, we got a question from Eric. I'm an idiot. Well, hold on. I got to stop you right there, Eric. Do not call yourself an idiot. Let all of us call you an idiot, okay? I'm here to help. I'm an idiot who tries to train everything at the same time. The powerlifting barbell lifts, higher rep kettlebell work, distance running and sprinting, while also playing recreational indoor soccer a few times a week. The Olympic lifts have helped my soccer performance and that's interesting, more than anything else, but I always end up compromising recovery whenever I add heavy Olympic lifts to my training. Is there any value in lightweight Olympic lifts, say five sets of two or three sets of three, at 50 to 60% a couple days per week? Actually, you know, if you're, and to answer Eric's question now, uh, actually, Eric, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen my movement matrix, but uh, on the far right, and, and don't get into moral theology, then there's nothing good or bad. It's just a progression. But on the far right of the matrix is the snatch and the clean and jerk. And the thing about the snatch and the clean and jerk, I argue in my work, is that that's a push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded, carry-ish kind of thing. 
In other words, the magic of the Olympic lifts is that it covers all the fundamental human movements in one movement. Uh, you know, it's funny. You, when people argue this with me, I, I usually answer, well, have you ever Olympic lifted? It's like, no, but I saw it on television. Well, you, until you've done it. I mean, I, I, a good Olympic lifting, and my students in St. Mary's discover this. An Olympic lifting, weightlifting, mean, it's true. You only get six attempts, you know, three snatch, three clean and jerk. But by the end of the day, you are uh, frazzled. Your nervous system is blown. You're, uh, you're hungry in the weirdest way, and you get the best night's sleep of the year. And then you wake up, and you are sore in places. Like, I get sore right here, right here after Olympic lifting, because I have to put so much tension in my body that I have to actually discover more places. Uh, someone's going to have to give here, Eric. Yeah, I, I think, especially where I was late in my career, five sets of two and three sets of three in these th that uh, lighter, those lighter loads were really instrumental for me keeping my snap as a discus thrower. But you got to remember, Eric, and this is going to sound weird, but, you know, I was snatching 300 and cleaning four, you know, over, over 300 and over four. So 70% for me in the snatch was 210. I mean, that was still, that was still a good load. So the thing is this, you, you asked a percentage question and I always have to answer the other question. What do you mean? What do you mean by percents? You know, as somebody who, there was a 17 year period between the first time I snatched body weight and when, and when I snatched 314 pounds, it was a 17 year uh, walk, which is a long walk folks. But so when I talk about percents, I talk about maximal lifts, lots of pressure on the platform, make or break kinds of things. That, so what you mean by 70% might be different. So the, the first thing I would say is uh, your 70%, let's say you're snatching 200, one but you pro might be able to snatch 250. I, you know, we don't have any numbers on your body. You, you snatching 135, 140 might not really impact you as much as, say, 185. So that's going to be something you have to study. But, yes, I, I think if you did that three days a week – and by the way, five sets of two um, – Five sets of two in the snatch is a good workout. Uh, the, the Dave Turner program I used to do, we used to do eight sets of two and then eight singles in the clean and jerk. Eight sets of two in the snatch, eight singles in the clean and jerk. Uh, you might want to try that instead of multiple reps in the clean and jerk. The clean and jerk just pounds you a lot. And it's just, it might be really hard to recover from that. So think maybe five sets of two in the snatch and five singles in the clean and jerk. And then get back to me after you've done that a few times. All right. Thank you, Eric. We have a question from Joseph, and, and it's an interesting question because I'd like to know more about what's behind this question. I was wondering if you could explain why you view meditation as being so important as you always include uh, this in your pirate map habits. Well, it's, it's a good question. I mean, you know, my background in religious studies, religious education, theology might be part of it, Joseph. Um, there's there's an interesting tradition. Now, I call this park bench and bus bench, but there's an interesting tradition in what I'm about to tell you. Uh, I don't like what I'm about to say. Okay, Joseph, I'm saying that out loud. I don't like it. I think it's... It, but there is a tradition that when a person prays, they're saying, hey, God or gods, you know, give me this. Uh, make this happen, do this. And when you meditate, you say, okay, God, gods, talk to me. That's, that's a foundational start of what I want to talk about. But one of the things, so I guess what I'm trying to say is meditation then traditionally is this quiet time where you are listening. Prayer is when you're speaking, meditation is when you're listening. By the way, I don't agree with what I just said 100%. I understand the tradition behind it, but there's some issues with it. One of the things I like about meditation personally is I have a problem, and if you're ever around me, you'll, you'll catch on to it quickly. Um, 
I'm a multitasker's multitasker. Uh, I'm constantly, you know, even as I'm sitting here, I want to straighten up my ruler. My ruler wasn't was where it was supposed to be. So I want to put my ruler back and, oh, um, so my day planner wasn't on top of my journal where it's supposed to be. So I want to fix that right now. Oh, did I turn off my phone? Oh, let me check my phone. Okay. What the one minute meditation does for me, that's an app on my phone, is I press it. I breathe out until I hear the first ding. And then I try to count my breaths, my breaths in that one minute. Then I try to get around six. After workouts, I do the same thing. I press it and my breath count is much higher. But here's what I find. I do it again. And within about a two minute and change, because I have to press the button twice, my I'll notice that my first round of breaths are about 12, and then I'm at eight or seven on my second. So I am consciously, probably physically, emotionally, spiritually, bringing everything down. With my extended meditations, uh, Joseph, what I'm trying to do is teach myself to stay single focused. I'm a big fan of guided meditations. And um, my family has a little joke for my guided meditations, they call it, dad is napping. And sometimes I nap, I do fall asleep. Now, if you fall asleep while you meditate, generally that's a sign that you don't get, you haven't had enough sleep. But in my case, I've noticed now that I, in these 15 minute meditations, that I'm in that weird place where I'm right on the edge of sleep and right on the edge of consciousness. So I can hear like my wife in the living room. I, I can hear uh, my grandkids watching something on Disney. I can hear it, but there's no reaction. So for me, Joseph, meditation is a tool I use to train my mind to push out all the squirrels and all the noise that, that hits me constantly and allows me to, to stay focused on one thing. You know, Joseph, you might not need it. But I do. Um, I'm, I, I know this. I'm, I'm kind of built different than a lot of people. Um, I mean, I have master's degrees in history and religious education. I can teach, I can teach you American football. I can coach you in American football. I can coach you in wrestling. I can coach you in any event in track and field. I can, I'm a strength coach. And here's the funny thing. In a one-week period, it's not unusual for me to do all of that. Literally all that. I, at one time, I could teach economics, history, and theology. At one school, I did all three at the same time, sacred scripture, and coached different sports. So I can multitask. But the problem with multitask sometimes is when you're multitasking all the time, to get yourself to go like this and take care of your taxes, be truly present with the ones you love. I personally need the tool of meditation to help me through it. We have a question from Guy. I get the sense that Guy is from England because he spelled armor wrong. My question is on the armor building complex. Uh, real quick for those who don't know, double kettlebells, two cleans, one press, three front squats. Is it effective with one heavy bell? See, here's the thing about that guy. Yes, but you have to make one small change. The load on the squats is going to kill you. So, so you're going to do single. You're going to go one, two, single, one, and then one, two, three. You're going to put the bell down. You're going to you know, catch your breath. What you have to do two cleans, one press, one, two, three squats. Now, here's the thing. You've done six squats. You've done six squats, but you've pressed here and pressed here. So if you decide to go with the single bell, now, I, I'm, there's a logic issue here. You're probably hearing it already. But what happens is to get the mix. So if I'm doing doubles, okay, and I'm pressing the same time, one, two, three squats. So you need two rounds to get your presses and cleans in. You got that? But in those two rounds, you did six squats. So the upside of the armor building complex with a single bell is that you're going to find you're going to find muscles you never knew 
because you're going to have to uh, lock down with that X. So I got the load here and I'm front squatting. I'm going to have to lock down my whole, this whole X to my left hip really tight while I do those reps. And of course the opposite this time is like doing suitcase carries. So it's, so it's this, I don't know if it's better or not, but it's clearly harder because a, you're doubling the number of squats to keep the arms, uh, the symmetry and the press and clean. And you're having to uh, tie that X the whole time through every single set and rep. So yes, it's very effective. I don't know of any moderations that actually work. Uh, you go, well, no, that's not why. Why even mess with it? Stick with the two cleans, one press, uh, three front squats, and just remind yourself that you've bargained for a, a harder, longer workout doing it this way. Um, if harder, longer is, is better, we'll, we'll find out. And you're going to get back to us, okay, guy? Okay, we have a question from Jeffrey. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how to train, practice, dialing up and down arousal when you need multiple levels in a single activity like, right, like rock climbing. Well, I wouldn't want your arousal too high when you're rock climbing, but I, I wrote a book called Now What? And, I, and there's, there's chapters on this. But one of the ways, well, there's, there's, there's two things. Let's just separate them out as best I can. First off, you can use your physical skills to help you with your mental arousal levels. And that's why, for example, uh, if you need to calm down, uh, bring your arousal down, getting warm, take a sauna, uh, do some jumping jacks, uh, go for a, a run, uh, put on a sweatshirt, put on more clothes, uh, shake your arms out, you know, uh, wiggle your jaw, smile, will bring your arousal down. If you have to raise your arousal, you can take uh, three buckets of really cold water and pour them on your head. One, two, three. It's called dousing. Uh, I can slap you across the face. That'll help your arousal levels go up. <laughs> In fact, I'd be honored to come slap you across the face, Jeffrey. Um, so you can use the physical side to practice getting your arousal up and down. For training, though, on the mental side, you might want to put yourself uh, – uh, you, 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 for throwers, for example, we do a one-throw competition to make them practice arousal. Um, you get six throws in a track meet, well, three and three. But sometimes it comes down to one throw. You can either win the nationals or don't, make the finals or don't. Um, so I have my athletes practice one-throw competitions where I really just say, here we go. You know, what, what are you made of? Um, for, for rock climbing, I'm wondering, and I wouldn't do this in any place that can get you killed, but, uh, can you, can you make a, like an indoor harnessed up climb where, for example, you usually use chalk. Well, today you don't use chalk. Well, not using chalk is going to change the game. Um, maybe you make a combination that is really, really difficult followed by a combination that's really, really simple. So what we're doing is practicing changes in arousal levels. Um, maybe um, dangle something, if, if it's safe, I don't know, but I was thinking about if you had a harness and you dangled like a something like a kettlebell or a dumbbell below you and <laughs> someone was to swing it. So as you're trying to climb, and don't go very high and make sure you're strapped in, so as you climb, things are changing. Or even something as simple as maybe a, a, a band or a rope that I can just tweak you just a tiny bit when you're trying to hold, maybe pretend like I'm the wind. Any Now, you know more about your sport than I do, and if, if these are safe ideas or not. But what you always want to do is practice appropriately. And that's what arousal training is. Um, if you do the same climb every day, every day, every day, you're really not going to improve. What you want to do is mess around with the dynamics and see how you respond to it. And so, yeah, um, we practice dialing it up and down constantly in American tra in track and field. It's just, it's just part of who we are. But I think in your sport, we could add some of that too. Darren asks, 
I wanted to ask how do you program DeLorme and Watkins? Do you use this approach for push, pull, hinge squat at the same time or only specific exercises? Uh, you know, Darren, I've written about this and I'm pretty sure it's on the site danjohnworkshops.com. Check that, danjohnworkouts.com. Um, it's in the area called easy strength. Yeah, program it all the time. Um, it's difficult because as much as I love the three sets of eight uh, protocol and the one minute rest, which I think is outstanding. I, I, so we use the three sets of eight protocol with one minute rest in between. For most people, we have to use machines to make it work. Um, I can do it with barbells and things like that. So there's a couple of programs I want you to look up, Darren. Uh, you can just type it online. T uh, Darren, and I have a program called the Transformation Program. Again, all this is available. DanJohnWorkouts.com. Uh, one's called the Transformation Program. So type in Dan John Transformation Program. There's also another one. If you type in Dan John and Delorme, you'll find how I do it. Uh, I've had I've done this with kettlebells. I've done it with a lot of things. The the biggest problem with the Delorme protocol, and everybody finds this, is it works tradition like the usual tradition about four to six weeks and then you have to change the rep schemes around um but during that six weeks it's marvelous um i still don't know of a better training program than three sets of eight with a minute rest in between um, the only problem is that third set is where you d define load and uh you have to be very smart about how you increase load on the, on these delorme pro uh, protocols um Brian Mann, who's now a professor down in uh, University of Miami, did a wonderful job. Basically, on the third set, if you can get up to 15 reps, it's way too light. Go up. 12 to 14 reps, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14 reps. Uh, you still probably can go up, but you know, don't be crazy. If you get 8, 9, or 10 reps, you're probably in the right wheelhouse. You could go up. If you only got 7, stay with that weight. If you only got two, three, four, five, or six, obviously the load's too heavy. Go lighter next time. Uh, but the bugaboo with the Lorem Watkins is the load progression over time. Uh, what you'll find is three sets of eight with a minute rest works great for a while. Then you have to switch up to something like five sets of five, maybe five sets of three, and go from there uh, to allow the loads to go back up. I hope that helped. You have to do some more research, Darren, and then you're going to get back to me, okay? Thank you. We have a question from Oliver. I'm 26. He's six foot one with long arms. Uh, my son-in-law has that issue. My question is this. Do you ever alter lifts or change exercises for a person to do their body proportions? The correct answer is yes. So I learned this when I worked with the Utah Jazz. You know, uh, I used to kind of make, and this isn't fair, I used to make fun of the guys because they were so bad at the bench press and squat and most lifts. And then one day I was, I was spotting Walter Palmer and he was back squatting. And the joke is, you know, you, you spot him like this, you, cause they're so tall. You have your hands over your head. And he started to squat. And as he came down, it, if you were 20 feet away, it looked like he was moving quickly, but it seemed like every rep took forever because that movement arm of a seven foot, four inch spine or core or whatever you want to call it, it took forever for him to get down to the deep spot and then forever for him to get back up. And I realized this is why Olympic lifters tend to be four foot six is the physics of a tall person squatting was kind of funny to watch. So it, just to get on to Oliver, my long arms, wide hips and broad back make carries, deadlifts and squats easy, but my presses have always lagged behind by a considerable margin. Um, there's, there's no follow up question to that, but yeah, that's gonna be tough. Um, long arms and wide hips, uh, the long arms is, is the issue there. I mean, you just have a longer arm. I mean, uh, it's, it's physics 101, you know, uh, uh, it's, that is just true. So yeah. Um, so you're gonna have to rethink, like when you look at, uh, standards, for example, or somebody else's standards, one of the first things you're gonna have to do is, is that appropriate for me? You know, like when I say I think everybody should be able to clean and press body weight, snatch body weight, and I just, I just 
wave it off like it's nothing. Uh, that might not be true for a seven foot four guy. You know, uh, that's just that's just not not reasonable. And it is possible for a, a short limb guy to be the best bench presser in the gym in just a few weeks. And uh, just because, you know, I had a teammate on my powerlifting team, and it's true, I was on a powerlifting team a million years ago, and uh, Mike, and Mike could bench with, Mike weighed in the 130s, 140s, you could bench with the best of them, but when you looked at his stroke and his bench press, <laughs> the joke was, <clears throat> there was, you know, one came one inch off his chest, you know, he had locked it out. It's not completely true, but boy, it was, it's close to being completely true. So yeah, it's an absolute thing we keep in mind. Um, you know, uh, I would strongly suggest if, if, if you were, instead of 26, you were 14, I would have you out at the track with me throwing the discus because you, you're built, you're built to throw the discus far, uh, hammer probably far. So, uh, you, you have gifts, but your gifts might not be the Olympic press. We have a question from Rich. I have a brother named Rich. I'm really, I'm really making a habit of the park bench workouts. They are excellent. Well, thank you, Rich. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of brain power in that, that those little generator. And thank you to Brian for that. What would be a good bus bench to throw in? I've answered this question before, and I know what I'm about to say. I'm a 53-year-old former collegiate hammer thrower who travels weekly for business. Goals are to rebuild legs, hips, glutes, and chest which has left my body because of sitting in meetings and airplanes constantly. First off, Rich, uh, hats off for you wanting to, that's, uh, that's a great little list. And the fact that you're a collegiate hammer thrower means that you're pretty smart. Smart enough to know that you don't need bus bench workouts yet. What I'd like you to keep doing is the three days a week bus bench, but I want you to start really thinking about incorporating with your travel schedule some kind of training. I always travel and listen. So my answer, the quick answer is this. Let's not worry about bus bench yet. Let's, let's, let's do this right now. I want you to walk more. And I also want you to invest in Brett Contreras has something called glute loops. And I want you to start traveling with one of them so that you start whenever, whenever you land, whenever you get going, I want you to think about a workout of clamshells and hip thrusts with the glute loop around. Let's build up. And then of course, Here's your, your, your other exercise for the, for the hotel room push-ups. Uh, one thing I would recommend if you can, um, I use two and a half pound plates, but you could probably use books or maybe even shoes is now if you're a former thrower, you're going to have shoulder issues is that you put your, you put something on the index finger and thumb and then let these three fingers on the ground. I hold on to, so I grab two and a half pound plates like this, and I have these three fingers on the ground. And what that does is it changes the angle just enough so that your elbow stays, uh, your forearm stays uh, perpendicular at the floor, your elbow stays packed, your shoulder stays packed, and it protects, the, it protects your shoulders. So I'm recommending clamshells. Uh, glute loops, uh, glute loops on clamshells, glute loops on hip thrusts, and push-ups whenever you land and go for walks. Rich, I want you to try that uh, whenever you travel, and then let's get back later to uh, some bus bench ideas. Right now, let's just keep on keeping on. Um, be sure you're using the generator, and make sure it says to consistently, uh, you know, get more difficult. Get get more difficult. And then I want you to get back to me. Let's go about six weeks, Rich, and let's get back, and I want to hear how you're doing. Thank you. Oh, Nathaniel, uh, he asked this question somewhere else, I think. Uh, why do you progress from a goblet squat to an overhead squat and then to a front squat? Uh, that's because that's what's in the Bible. Okay, that's not true. <laughs> that's funny, though. Uh, most coaches progress. Okay, they don't. You're about to make a statement, Nathaniel, it's not true. Most coaches progress the goblet to a front squat, and usually the overhead squat is the last progression after the back squat. That's not true. I mean, that's. I mean, I've been, I've been to a million gyms, uh, and uh, a most people never squat, so that's big. And b when they do squat, it's only it's always these freakish looking back squats that have nothing to do with uh, with with squatting. 
So the reason I go from goblet squat to overhead squat is because I figure this, Nathaniel, if you can overhead squat, you can front squat, you can back squat. If you can back squat, if, if all you've ever done is back squat, I guarantee I'm not going to get you to front squat because it's going to hurt your wrists because you've never squatted here. You probably generally squatted here and you're not going to get to an overhead squat because you don't have that uh, open, mobile, flexible body. So for me, I went to this, I went to this a couple of years ago. In fact, I taught this yesterday with two, uh, two high school football players and it was fascinating to watch them complain about how much their backs hurt. You know what the load in the overhead squat was? Piece of PVC pipe. They they were getting schooled by having to hold that PVC pipe in place up there. Their their ability to plank was almost zero. Um, so that's why I do it. Um, somebody asked me one time some idiotic question about well you know the load goes this way. Uh, I don't want to hear. It. Listen. Don't, don't take this too far. I go goblet squat because that, in fact, that's all most people ever need. The overhead squat because it demands such a high level total body planking. Then the front squat because that keeps the load up here. And then, in fact, I'm not even sure I teach the back squat. Uh, one of the kids told me one time the workout said back squat. And another kid said to him, what's a back squat? And my athlete A said, well, that's when you hold the weight here. He goes, I, I, I've never done it before. He goes, God, it's so much easier than front squatting. And the kid did it, never done it before. First set, nailed it. And he goes, my God, that's so much easier. Yeah. <laughs> and they went on to the workout. So, yeah, I think if you do, if you can overhead squat, you can back squat. If you can front squat, you can back squat. But the reverse is not true. And that's why I do it. Um, here's the one hard thing about this, Nathaniel. I don't know how to say this kindly. I'm right. Nancy has a question. When I am doing my workouts in the gym, I have noticed quite a few young people bench pressing with severely exaggerated backs so much, in fact, that the only contact seems to be their scapula. It's called the arching, okay? I realize that an arch is used by competitive powerlifters, but it seems to have sunk into the recreational crowd. Uh, it's not sunk. It's been around since the 70s uh, that I know of because I watch people do it. When I was taught bench pressing many, many years ago, this was not the technique. Can you explain to me the safety of this on the spine? I, I can't. I don't think it's safe on the spine, but I can't explain if it's safe or not. I, I, I prefer you not do this. Is it a high risk or am I just too old fashioned? No, Nancy, not old fashioned at all. You're, you're, you're in this terrible place called being right. Um, and it's my knock on so much training in the last 40 years. 45, 50 years, you know, these young kids are trying to just get more on the bench and more is just more. Uh, the hard thing is all that tossing like this isn't going to carry over in the field of play or even for the physiques that they're trying to build. Now, I got nothing with trying to lift more weight, but you got to do it right. Um, I understand CrossFit uses this concept called slop factor or something like that. I am so against crappy reps. I don't know how you would ever in good consciousness, conscience, allow that to happen. Because all you need to do is get hurt once and you could be hurt forever. Um, no, you're right, Nancy. Um, when I mean, I, I do think you should have a, 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 you know, your butt should be on the bench, your, your, your shoulder, you know, whatever you want. You said scapula, that's fine. And then in the middle, you do want to have an arch. You want to bring that, because you want to bring that chest up. Uh, you want to... You know, you want to squeeze your lats, you know, it's part of the lift. But yeah, you're right. I, I, I agree with you. Um, but I also see Nancy. I mean, you could ask the same question about these back squats that people do in the gym where they get to one eighth, you know, the, the, their, their knees barely bend, you know, um, that nonsense. Or the, the guys who do good mornings instead of squatting and they call it a squat. I, um, one of the worst places you can go for uh, exercise information is the gym. So no, you're right. You're right. You're right. So do it the right way. It's a tough lesson, you know. Uh, to me, arching is a shortcut, and I got nothing against shortcuts in competition. If I'm going to try to win, I'm going to try to get you to win as fast as we can. Having said that, there are times in life where shortcuts just don't work. Uh, good question, Nancy.
Zachary asks a very nice little question. I am curious about your thoughts on how heavy to go on swings. Um, Zachary, I'm a, I'm, I'm a pretty good swinger uh, <laughs> with kettlebells. Uh, for me, I can get up to the 48 and I can do good sets with about 10 or 15. I've done the 60 kilo kettlebell for swings. Here's the problem is once you go past, and honestly, once you go past the 24, you're in a very interesting cost to benefit matrix. So all you need with the 60 kilo kettlebell is one bad swing and all of a sudden the physics kick in and your poor spine or maybe your that one disc by itself is like, I don't know what you want, but we can't do it. So if your swing technique is really good, really good, you can probably swing heavier. But what happens is, and I see people look like it, it, it looks like a wobbling deadlift. It's not an actual boom, boom, boom swing. Um, I would say for most men, Zachary, that once you get past the 32, you'd better really have your technique locked down, okay? For women, honestly, uh, I, I work with some women who are extraordinarily good at this this movement. Great hinge, great plank, great hinge, great plank. And I watch them hit that 24, and um, it's just becomes physics. They're throwing it far, and you can see their feet grabbing the ground really hard. I had one woman tell me one time how she always knew she had a good uh, swing workout because in the middle of the night, her feet would cramp up because they're grabbing the ground to counter those bells. So for me, let's just say this. Let's make, a, make up a formula. Let's say 24 for females, 32 for men. Occasionally, you can go heavier, but boy, take a moment to ensure that your technique is spot on and there's value in going heavier that day. We have a question from Harsh Varden. My sister is 33 year old, is 33 years old. Harsh Varden, I'm married, okay? Oh, it's a joke, okay. Uh, she is five foot four and she weighs 118 pounds, 118 kilos, sorry, which is 260. She has been obese since uh, about almost a decade. Before that, she was just overweight. She has managed to reduce her weight on multiple occasions, ranging from 15 to 20 kilos. For my Americans, basically about, you know, 35 to uh, 44 pounds. But she gains the weight lost time and again, That's which is a very big issue, you know. She has, she has had her blood work done, and it is normal. And it's 5'4", 260 with normal blood work. I know weight fat loss is mostly based on nutrition, but the problem is that she is able to sustain dietary control only for a few weeks before she gives into her usual bad eating habits. It's not that she lacks conviction, but the weight fat to be lost is just too much. Ah, you know, I have a couple of friends who are better, better suited for this. I'm thinking of uh, Brittany and I'm thinking of Amy. Uh, these are women uh, just a little bit, well, in one case, older than your sister. And all I can say is, obviously, she, your sister knows what to do. The problem is she hasn't yet had that moment. Where it, it, well, it, one way we say it in the United States, she's got a good case of should, she's got a good case of could, but she doesn't have a case of must yet. Should your sister lose weight? Well, at 5'4", 260, I mean, yeah, I mean, she, she should. I mean, that uh, the statistical the statistical numbers hitting her in the face are high. Um, the 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 you know once she starts sliding into what we call what, what we used to call I think we they still might use the term syndrome X. That's the high blood pressure, pre diabetic to diabetic. That's the, uh, uh, the high cholesterol. That that's that whole cascade of things that happens when you with with obesity. Uh, so should she now? Could she lose weight? Well, yeah. According to what you told me, she's lost uh, 20k before. She should be able to do it again. Um, 
and she seems to be getting on the right track and then stops. And the reason is, uh, some of us would argue, is she doesn't have the must we. There's a must moment. Um, you know, I have had stories from people tell me. Uh, one woman said, I am so fat, my husband won't touch me. And I, I didn't know how to respond to that. And yet this woman still made no attempt. So having her husband not touch her did not incur a must moment in her life. And yet when you talk to people who've been overweight and have lost 100 pounds, all of them have literally a moment where everything changes. Uh, one woman, it's when her child said, I'm a, I don't like you at school, mommy, because you're fat. And that was the must. That's That was the must. One of the easiest ways, easiest, as far as I don't know of an easy way to do this, <laughs> but one thing I, I picked up from Tony Robbins is we make a chart with our, uh, with my, people who tell me they have a big goal, we make a chart. And the chart is this. It's very simple. It's very, in fact, it's going to sound silly when I go through it. So if I do lose, and let's just say we want, I don't know how much you want her to get down. Let's say get under 200 pounds, okay? Uh, get get to 90 kilos, okay? Um, do get to 90 kilos. Don't get to 90 kilos. The pleasure of that, the pain of that. And then you fill in the chart. And you, I've done this before on this podcast, but it's worth your time. But when you sit down with your sister and you say, what would be the pleasure of getting the 90 kilos or 80 kilos or whatever the magic number is? Well, the pleasure might be she fits into better clothes or she isn't in pain when she walks or, or, or whatever those pleasures are. You write that in. Um, then you drop down. What is the pleasure of not getting the goal? Now, when I first say this, people always go, what do you mean by that? Well, I would say this to your sister. Well, obviously, you get a lot of pleasure by weighing 260. Otherwise, you wouldn't keep coming back to it. Boy, does that piss people off, man. Holy cow. You want to offend someone? That's, your, that's how you win. Right there is how you win. Um, <laughs> wait, you must be getting pleasure because staying here, you, you you're staying here, there must be some pleasure. Well, and she might say, well, I get to eat anything I want. Okay. You are choosing the joy of comfort food or food versus um, not eating those foods. Um, is there any, and the next one over now is pain. Is there any pain in getting your goals? You know, uh, Hurst Vernon, I'm one of the rare people in the world that's actually gotten the bulk of the goals they ever set up to have. Uh, I'm, I bet you I'm batting in the high nineties and, and I got to tell you in a strange way, you know, I, I think I mentioned this before on, with Brian on, on one of our podcasts, you know, you're sitting there in a dorm room at Utah state university. It's been the thing you've been working for day in, day out for the past six years and it's really loud because the freshmen are all jerks and they were all going to fail by the first quarter anyway. And they're all partying, they're getting drunk, they're throwing up in the hallway. And, you know, you're missing your family, you're missing your friends, uh, you're sore as hell from training, you can't sleep because the, the dorm is so loud. And, and then you have to remind yourself, this is what you wanted. There's a lot of pain in getting your goals. I mean, you have to give up a lot. You have to sacrifice things that other people do. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just that there is pain in getting your goals. I'll tell you another pain is no matter what I've succeeded in my life, some jackass will always walk up to me right after I win the Pleasanton Highland Games or the national championships in Spokane. Almost within minutes, someone walks up and says, so are you going to... And it's you know, go to another Highland Games the following weekend, come back next year and defend it. You know, they do that at the Olympics all the time. You got that gold medal around the neck and some jackass reporter says, sorry to come back in four years and repeat it. And it's like, 
dude, I barely had this thing on my neck for five minutes. Can I enjoy my five minutes? And then the last one is, is there pleasure in not getting, uh, is there pain in not getting your goal? Is there pain in not getting your goal? This is a good one to focus on. And this is the one I want you to spend some time with your sister is, what are the pains by not trying this again? What are the pains? I, I, I'm no psych guy. Uh, it's just not a, a skill set I have, but this is how you get people to that must. I must get this goal. Um, yeah, I failed on goals, man. I have, but it doesn't mean I haven't had the strive. Now, earlier in this thing, I talked about the process. And one of the things I think that's hurting maybe your sister, maybe, maybe, is that instead of focusing on the results from now on, I want you to focus on the process. And the process is going to be this. The process is, let me just tell you how I would do it. Every night I would write up a to-do list, you know, a couple hours before we go to bed for her next day. I don't know what she does for a living. I don't know what her family situation is. But what are the things she needs to do tomorrow? So to clear that head, okay? And then from that moment on, she's preparing for sleep. I'd love it if you maybe go take a sledgehammer, go into her house and break every television set, uh, break every computer, break every iPad. Um, so after 7 o'clock at night, she can only read books or read books to her kids or whatever. No TV, no blue screens, no nothing. And she has to sleep eight or nine hours a night. When she wakes up in the morning, the first thing she needs to do is take a moment aside and be grateful for something. Uh, I remember Pat Flynn telling me one time, he's always grateful for butterflies. And I thought that was kind of funny. Um, I'm so it's I, I'm so grateful this year for so many things. Uh, that's actually hard for me to get through that every day. I've, I've had such an interesting year. You know, I, I buried my brother one Saturday, and the next Saturday I walked my daughter down the aisle at her wedding. Um, that uh, that gives you a lot to think about. And then, okay, so sleep ritual, good night's sleep, be grateful, and then she has to drink water as her major beverage all the time. I'd love to see her do something like intermittent fast every day. Try to have fasting windows of at least 16 hours from last night's dinner to her first meal. I'd love it if she would exercise. I'd love it if she would say focused on vegetables first. You know, it's the old joke I always tell people, I have this perfect diet. You can eat anything you want. But first, you have to eat two pounds of salmon, a whole carton of cottage cheese, a dozen eggs, uh, one pound of salad. You see where this is heading, right? A whole carton of uh, blueberries. And then after that, eat anything you want. Or, it, originally, it was like 14 items. Um, if she is proactive with eating the good food first, drinking, you know, drinking water first, eating vegetables first, eating protein first, fasting first, <clears throat> good things will happen. I'd love to see her fast, do some form of exercise, <clears throat> pardon me, and then eat. Um, your question is not unusual. It's, you're not the first to bring this up. And uh, sadly, you're not going to be the last. And I'm here to help any way I can. Thank you. Well, as we close this year, 2019, uh, I would like all of you to consider what I, something my wife and I do every year is we take out a piece of paper, we write a top 10 list of the best things that happen and the worst things. Some years, our top 10 list on great things is 18, 20, 25 things. And some years, our worst list is one, two, or three things. Um, and I suggest you keep it because I've been doing this since 1986 or 87. And one of the cool things about doing this little list is it gives you a chance to, to, to be like what Janice, January, it gives you a chance to look back and then by looking back, you get a chance to see the mistakes, the triumphs, the glories, and the failures of last year. And if you do that resolution thing, which I don't recommend, it gives you a chance to say, okay, here's, here's what's good. Let's, let's just try to make this a little better. I wish you the best and brightest of the new year. Um, as always, it's my honor to work with all of you. Um, 
this past year, not only did I bury my brother, but I buried my junior college coach. And it constantly reminds me of the role my mentors had on me and how it made my life, the, the, the grand and glorious life that I have now. And if I'm any way to help you, if I'm here in any way helping you, that makes my year too. Uh, thank you so much. If you have questions, please, please send them to podcast at danjohnworkouts.com. Thank you so much. And let's just rock 220.